Hello everyone and welcome to today's episode of Theory Thursday. Today we're going to be looking at a book called Toward Soviet America by William Z. Foster. We're in chapter 5 but we're not going to be doing the entirety of chapter 5. Instead we're just going to be looking at this short part here called Curing Crime and Criminals. There are nine little paragraphs so we're just going to go three, 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 and that should do it. So I personally haven't read all of this text, it's quite big, but I've read a few chapters. It's truly astounding what Foster has written. And obviously if you listen to Revolutionary Lumpen Radio, you know what we're about here. So you know that cure and crime and criminals in particular as a concept is one that we absolutely have to divulge in. And we hope that people get a lot out of this text. It's really interesting, informative, and it highlights the role that crime plays within capitalist society in relation to the bourgeoisie. So that will fail Ryan's going to take us away with the first three chapters, then we'll have a discussion on what we thought of it. Right, yeah, let's hop into it. Capitalism, by its very nature, is a prolific breeder of crime. It is a system of legalized robbery of the working class. The whole process of capitalist business is a swindle and an armed holdup. In capitalist society, what constitutes crime and what does not is a purely arbitrary distinction. The capitalists do not recognize any line of demarcation for themselves. They do whatever they can get away with. The record of every large fortune and big corporation in the country is smeared not only with brutal robbery of the workers, but also statutory crime of every description, from the bribery of legislations to plain murder. Wall Street is full of uncaught Krugers. In a society where each grabs what he can at the expense of the rest, naturally the government offers a wide field of corruption. It is a well-known fact, emphasized afresh by the Seabury investigation in New York, that every city and state in this country is controlled by grafting politicians, allied with the criminal underworld. The Teapot Dome scandal, not to mention numerous others, shows that the national government is also permeated with this gross corruption. Such corruption is not a special condition, but the very tissue of capitalism itself. It is not surprising that in a system of society where the aim is to get rich by any means, crime of every kind should flourish, faced by low wages and other impossible economic conditions on the one hand, and the corrupt example of capitalism generally on the other, Many naturally take to lives of open crime to try and seize at the point of a gun what the capitalist big shots steal through the exploitation of workers, by a corner on the stock exchange, or by corrupting the government. The main difference between their operations is primarily one of dimension. Al Capone is an altogether legitimate child of American capitalism, and it is no accident that he is an object of such widespread admiration. Scorching first three paragraphs you can see why we we like this i just want to highlight a few points because you mentioned the basically the concept of crime in itself what constitutes crime is purely an arbitrary distinction within capitalism i just want to go over that in case people don't understand what what it means by arbitrary distinction i think that my example that i would give you is, is something like I couldn't produce and sell firearms to my comrades, but if I, for example, was a capitalist <laughs> owner of BAE Systems, I could not only produce firearms, but I could produce nuclear bombs that, you know, could, could be sold on, on the market to other countries or, you know, just ordinary ordinance and especially firearms. So what's the difference between me doing that and the capitalist? is an arbitrary distinction in the sense that it's legal for them to do that. It's written in text by other ruling class capitalists, whereas with me, I'm just a proletariat. So it's a crime for me to sell firearms, but it's not actually a crime to sell firearms if you're a capitalist. What do you think of that? Is, is that right, Ryan, as an arbitrary distinction of what is and isn't crime? Yeah, for sure. And I mean, this comes down to what I was talking about you know, what I've said before, right, about the law being a function of power, not a function of justice. So the laws aren't there to tell you what's just and what's unjust, because if murder really was a crime, then war would be illegal, right? But instead, yeah. murder's not legal, murder's not uh, uh, against the law for those people, because war's perfectly fine, right? So the law is simply a distinction of power, who has power and who doesn't, much rather than, you know, any function of justice. Because, as we say, all those corporations, all the, you know, the, the military industrial complex, etc., right, they make money from war. And so it's perfectly fine for them to, you know, murder or invade nations or overthrow governments or whatever, not because it's 
intrinsically wrong in itself to not do those things. They just get to do those things because they control the law. It's easy to say that war is legal, particularly as um, somebody from the, the belly of the beast, where we can project war on other nations through the United Nations to, to actually make it legal. And it is that power that you're talking about. For example, if we were to go to war with Iran, that would be passed through legislation as legal. But if Iran was to go to war with us, we'd all be told it was an illegal war that wasn't sanctioned by like the United Nations and all of that. And really, it's the capitalists that the bourgeoisie, the people in power who are making these arbitrary distinctions that people actually genuinely believe in. But what this is doing is highlighting the hypocrisy within bourgeois democracy. Furthermore, the text also says the capitalists do not recognize any line of demarcation for themselves. So that would be exactly what I've just said about the West uh, projecting war on, on Iran, but Iran couldn't do it back legally. But the capitalists will do whatever they can get away with. And we see this all the time with opportunist products that uh, produce waste and climate change and the just you know, damage that they're doing to people in the environment. They, they do it because they can get away with it and profit from it. They can make record <laughs> fortunes off it. And another point that the text was making is that it is literally robbing the workers because a lot of these things, such as war, such as the, the production of weapons, is coming from our taxes, is coming from our exploitation of labour even more. It just goes back to that saying, right? Behind every great fortune is a great crime. Yeah, he also touches on bribery of legislatures and just plain murder. I mean, yeah, they definitely do bribe politicians, business owners, and yes, they can simply murder with impunity. Look at the military industrial complex for, for further details. Or oh, as Suleimani. Yeah, so and, and an interesting quote, it's not surprising that in a system where the main aim is to get rich by any means, crime of every kind should flourish. And you just look at what happened recently, whenever there's riot, so we live in a system that's consumed by consumption to consume in abundance, so it's no surprising that when riots occur, all the shops get looted because we're, we're brought up on, you know, to consume and to accumulate products and things and clothes. So, of course, the people who are living in the system know of no other logical thing to do but other than riot and then deal and pillage shops and loot. So every time you hear the news and, you know, bourgeois media talking about the people looting, well... <laughs> They need to look at themselves and look at what imperialism is and then see whether there's a correlation between imperialist nations and, and small time looters, basically one and the same thing. I mean, just look at the Queen's crown that's filled with gems from all around the world, you know. I mean, there's also something to be said there for like the idea of capitalist realism, right? The idea that like, even when people are supposedly being like violent and anti-establishment, like the only thing they can think of doing is like consuming and taking products from stores and things, because that's ultimately what all of society is built around. And even on, on some level, I'm sure they don't know it consciously or whatever, but on some level, they understand that like, if you want to piss off the system in one way or another, consumer goods are way more important to capitalists than people's lives. So nothing makes them more angry than like robbing a Walmart. That angers them way more than the shooting or the killing of a person, for sure. And what was Che's quote about the value of, of property? The value of a human being is greater than all the property of all the millionaires on the planet or something? Yeah, that's it. Okay, so we'll move on because Comrade Foster goes on to talk about what the American Soviet government would do regarding all of this crime previously mentioned. So we'll go into it. The American Soviet government will liquidate the mountain crime wave, which, according to the Wilkerson Committee, cost the government a billion dollars yearly. Socialism, by putting an end to capitalist exploitation, deals a more or blow a crime of every description. The economic base of crime is destroyed. The worker is enabled to live and work under the best possible conditions. There's no place for human sharks to prey upon their fellow men. Not only does the abolition of capitalism destroy the basis of the so-called crimes against property, but the, revolutionary, but the revolutionized economic and social conditions involving an intelligent mo 
moral code and effective educational system also greatly diminishes the crimes of passion or this opportunists that they call looters. These facts are already demonstrated in the Soviet Union, which is fast becoming a crimeless country. While the exigencies of the revolutionary struggle against the counter-revolution made it necessary from time to time to confine a considerable number of political prisoners, the need is now fast passing with the consolidation of the socialist regime and the liquidation of the last remnants of the exploiting classes in the Soviet Union. Life and property are safer now in the USSR than in any other country in the world. Crime is rapidly sinking into abeyance and this will be more and more the case as the new society becomes strengthened. Capitalism blames crime upon the individual instead of upon the bad social conditions which produce it. Hence, capitalism's treatment of crime is essentially one of punishment. But the failure of its prisons with the terrible sex starvation graft, overcrowding, idleness, stupid discipline, ferociously long sentences and general brutality is overwhelmingly demonstrated by the rapidly mounting numbers of prisoners and the long list of terrible prison riots. Capitalist prisons are actually schools of crime. Even the Stanpat Wickersman Committee had to condemn the atrocious American prison system as brutal, medieval and fruitless. So the first thing, he, what he's talking about here is like the contrast between the way in which he would solve crime and the way in which, you know, capitalists attempt to solve crime. So the way that capitalists attempt to do this is just legislation, right? But that doesn't actually fix anything, right? Like making drugs illegal doesn't make drugs disappear. All you do is you push it underground, you push it into the hands of, you know, criminal enterprises or gangs, and then you get people like Al Capone, right? You're essentially allowing Al Capone a place in the market, quote unquote, right? Because there's always going to be a demand and a supply of everything. So when the government says, you know, just pick a drug, weed, weed's illegal, that doesn't make weed disappear. What that's actually doing is that's the government saying, we are not going to supply this. So that just puts a message out to anyone out there and that opens up the market. All right, we're not going to do this. So who is, right? The demand's still there. People still want it. So the question becomes, who's going to supply it? And that's when, you know, you get the Al, the Al Capones of the world, right? Al Capone was famous through um, the abolition of alcohol. It has a word, I forget. But yeah, that's what the government made him rich, essentially. The government said, we are not supplying alcohol anymore. So Al Capone said, guess what? I am now, right? They What they did is they gave Al Capone essentially a monopoly on the market. They yeah. just let him take it over, right? It's now his business. He now runs that, which means he's now getting rich from this. And that's how laws work. They do not get, laws do not stop crime. Laws create crime. Do you think that this text is getting that the fact that Al Capone and the politicians were probably both corrupt in some way to facilitate the crime that Al Capone was perpetrating? Yeah, he was definitely think? corrupt. You have to be. He had to. He he was running a criminal enterprise, right? Essentially, he was the head of a gang. And whenever you're the head of a gang, you know, the same way power politics works, right? You have to manage your supply. And this is where it intertwi in intertwines with business so closely because he has to manage his supply. He has to manage his stock. He has to check his supply chains. He has to fight people for turf, right? And that's how you get turf wars. That's how you get people shot. That's how you get, right? And it is a business, right? You can just think of him as like a an, a, an alcohol supplier, but because he's not quote unquote legal, he can step outside the law in ways that, well, companies can also, but they'll, they'll, they'll just never receive any punishment for it. And also not in quite the same way, right? Like Al Capone can, I mean, he did, right? He, he, he shot people. He ordered hits on people. He took over turf because that's what his business requires. He's got the alcohol and he's got a damn near monopoly on it. So what does the monopoly want? The monopoly wants to maintain its monopoly, right? And that's why you get you know, like turf wars for drugs over like who controls what block. Because the more blocks you control in America, that is the more blocks you control, the more of the market you have, the more money you make. So that's where violence comes into this. It's all essentially a turf war. But when it's outside of the law like this, it can be settled with violence. And the theory is that when it's done by a quote unquote legitimate business, they don't have to resort to violence. They can resort to the courts. But mm. the problem is that that's actually not what happens. Of course, they still use violence anyway, but that's the theory. It just doesn't work out that way.
Yeah, nice one. So that was a good insight into the operation of crime, corruption and capitalism. But what this podcast talking about is how the American Soviet government is going to liquidate crime. And it does that by <laughs> saying it will deal a more all blow to crime in every description because the economic base of crime is destroyed. Workers are unable to live and work under the best possible conditions and there's no place for human sharks to prey upon the fellow men. So I think that that's self-explanatory is if you've got your material conditions needed, you're not going to be desperate enough to commit crimes to, you know, get one up to, you know, get that extra, <laughs> get get that extra food in, you know, if you've got everything provided for you. So do you think that that's true, Ryan? Do you think that with socialism and our needs met that people aren't going to have to turn to crime? <laughs> yes, ultimately. You'll still have, you know, whatever small tiny percent of people that want to do it just because they're not doing it for you know the basis of material needs they're doing it because you know it's fun or whatever whatever but for the most part yes i mean crime is born out of a need of material conditions and if you supply those material conditions to people then they won't need to commit that crime right the idea is that you essentially chop off the economic legs of crime because you know poverty is you know the hugest driver of crime and if you don't have you know, a class society where people live in, some people live in complete luxury while others live in complete squalor, right? Then if you don't have that disparity and that the wealth is, you know, much more equitably shared, then you won't have a permanent underclass of people having to resort to crime just to survive. Yeah, no, you're trying to answer so back that up. I don't actually have the statistics, but Foster mentions that the, what you've just said is already demonstrated in the Soviet Union, which was fast becoming a crimeless country. I'm sure that Foster, Foster didn't just pull that out of his ass and then just say that I think that he probably had the statistics around before writing that. So there's some evidence for you. Yeah, I was trying to look at like the top or the bottom of the page to see if there was like the year in which, like which year he wrote this. It was 1926. Just to finish off on this paragraph, he finishes up by saying, but the revolutionized economic and social conditions involving an intelligent moral code and effective educational system also greatly diminish the crimes of passion. <laughs> so the Soviet Union is actually training people to you know, right and wrong and to teach people about crimes of passion and basically logic and being a good citizen. But over here, the education's just so limited. And the last thing it does is teach models only so far that it doesn't affect the teacher's ability to teach. Sure. Oh, yeah. It's also there, right, when it says capitalism blames crime upon the individual, right? This is the whole in individual, you know, bootstrap ideology, the atomization of each people into sort of crystalline structures, you know, compartmentalize everyone into be just individuals, alienation from labor and each other, etc. <clears throat> because that is ultimately what, you know, capitalism fosters. It fosters the, the philosophy of the individual, right? And that's how you get the selfish acquisition of capital that they were talking about before, you know, do whatever you can to get rich, right? The sort of get rich or die trying mentality it's you know by any means um and that's why he goes on to say that the the treatment of this crime is essentially one of punishment right because if you think of crime as being an individual fault and an individual failing and a sort of lack of moral fiber in the individual then the logical conclusion to that is punishment for not having such a thing but when you actually understand that you know crime is a result of bad social conditions which produce it then that lays crime at the feet of capitalism right because that is essentially where this comes from yeah well said it's a philosophical distinction that's also why for me stealing from huge shops is not a crime that's not immoral and uh it's good actually yeah <laughs> totally with you there don't steal from the people steal from the capitalist millionaires <clears throat> billionaires simple for sure also like don't steal from like tiny little corner shops go to like giant multinational chains okay. because here's the thing like because of the uh the sheer number of product that they're pushing like they have like a certain amount in the line item that can just be written off as like lost or damaged product so they can get rid of so much and not even feel it not even worry about it so the idea that like you can't afford food but if you steal a loaf of bread that's they're going to give a shit about that they'll give a shit insofar as they want you prosecuted for that because they don't want other people to do it but it's not hurting them it's not hurting their bottom line they don't even feel it they don't even get you know one percent of one percent of one percent close to feeling it they don't they don't give a shit about that loaf of bread 
as a loaf of bread. They care about the philosophical concept of, you know, not stealing so that other people don't steal. Because if they allow one pe one person to steal and they don't get caught, you know, next day you'll have five and then you'll have 10 and then you'll just have a run on the um, supermarkets, essentially. They're, they're looking for the sort of slippery slope fallacy. They don't care about the actual loaf of bread because they throw out tons of loaves of bread the second they go out of like sell by date or whatever they'll throw them all out right so they don't give a shit about the product itself it's about the the message it's sending to the society through crime the hypocrisy of this crime being perpetrated is the lithium batteries that you'd probably be stealing because they're expensive as anything <laughs> well they want to steal that flipping lithium from bolivia anyway so you know fuck them yeah for sure I mean, there are all sorts of moral, moral and philosoph philosophical implications. Like, <clears throat> I mean, you could easily just have a conversation about, you know, morality and philosophy in itself in the idea that, like, you know, most things that capitalism considers moral is, is uh, certainly not. And by the way, capitalism doesn't, and I mean, as, as they've said before, capitalism does not even consider theft immoral because duh, colonialism, right? They will invade other nations and steal their resources, or they will go to Africa and steal people as a resource. So they don't care about, they're not like philosophically against stealing as a principle. On the contrary, they'll do it by any means, For sure. whatever they can get away with. The second it benefits them and the second that they can pay the lawmakers to not pay attention to it, they'll do it in a heartbreak. Mm -hmm. Socialist criminology, on the other hand, attacks the bad conditions. While the American Soviet government will ruthlessly break up underworld gangs that brazenly infest all American cities and will also give short shift to grafting politicians, the prison system will be essentially educational in character. In the new Russian prisons, for example, the prisoners have the right to marry and to live with their families. They are taught useful trades and are paid full union wages for their work. These are gulags, by the way, that you've heard about gulags. They're just prisons, and as you can see, they were taught useful trades and they were paid full union wages for their work. There were no guards or walls or bars. Okay, well, that part's not the union, but collect part. The discipline is organized entirely by the prisoners themselves. The prisoners are also allowed freely to visit their friends in other towns. The length of the terms are to be served are determined by the prisoner committees. On the basis of of the fitness of the given prisoners to resume their places in society. The whole terminology of crime, criminal, passion, prison, etc. has been abandoned in such institutions. Upon release, a prisoner is not only able to make his way in society, but is welcomed. He is eligible to belong to the Communist Party and requires very little imagination to see the great advantages of this socialist system all over the barbarous prisons of capitalist countries. Congressman W.I. Serovich said after a recent visit to the Soviet Union, the Russian prison systems sets an example that is worthy of emulation by any nation in the world. Prohibition based upon a criminal alliance between capitalists, crooked politicians and gangsters has bred a growth of criminals such as the world has never seen before. And the best minds of the country stand powerless before the problem. The American Soviet government will deal with this question by eliminating prohibition, by establishing government control over the manufacture and sale of alcoholic liquors, these measures to be supported by an energetic campaign among the masses against excessive drinking. This way of handling the prohibition question is working successfully in the Soviet Union. Shortly after the October, October Revolution, the, go the Soviet government prohibited the sale or manufacture of alcoholic drinks, but soon bootlegging began, with familiar, demoralizing consequences. Poisonous liquor was made, much badly needed grain was wasted, open violation of the law existed on all sides. Then, with characteristic vigor and clarity of purpose, the government legalized the making and selling of intoxicating beverages. At the same time, a big campaign was initiated by the government, the party, and the trade unions, etc., to educate the workers against alcoholism. The program is succeeding. The evils of alcoholism are definitely on the decline. Doubtless, the Russians have found the real solution of the liquor question. Just as socialism is abolishing so many evils, it is also rapidly wiping out alcoholism as the mass of misery and degradation that accompanies it. 
Some interesting points that I thought was prohibition based upon a criminal alliance being between capitalists, crooked politicians and gangsters has bred the growth of criminals such as the world has never seen before. And I mean, we've got to thank Gary Redd for pointing that out in modern times, linking the CIA to the cracker epidemic. This has never been criminals like that. It is so high in government. The CIA, I mean, the cracker epidemic flooding black neighbourhoods in America with it. You know, degree of crime with Nicaragua's contra rebel fucking drug traffickers. Yeah, that's really. exactly what I was going to mention, actually. Like, that was Rick Ross, right? Rick Ross. You didn't know that? He's a DJ. Nah, dude, the OG Rick Ross sold crack that was um, imported by the CIA, and he was funding the, the Contras. Is there a film with Tom Cruise about it? Uh, I don't know, but you said film with Tom Cruise, so I'm going to say probably. <laughs> I reckon that he is, you know, it's, I can't remember. Probably. It's, it's good. you got to watch that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, that, that's just pointing it out. And then we look at, you know, as we mentioned, JP Morgan with a container ship with $1 billion worth of crack cocaine on it once again. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like it doesn't end. This, the linking of crooked politicians and gangsters is so normal um, that, that the word crooked may as well just be for entertainment purposes, like like we're watching a pantomime rather than something we should all fucking seriously and abolish. Yeah, and I mean, they enabled them, right? I mean, that is literally what he's saying here. Like, crime is not just an emergent property of material conditions, but it's also an orchestrated thing, right? It's the result of the collaboration between, like he says, you know, crooked, you know, politicians and everything. And um, they're not against crime, right? The the goal of capitalism is here is not to stomp out crime they don't want that now they will invest more money in police that will kick down more doors etc etc but ultimately they benefit from having an enemy like that they benefit from having uh, a criminal underworld because they can use it as a scapegoat they can use it as an enemy they can use it to go to voters and say vote for me because i'm i'll be the anti-crime guy and they can use it to increase police budgets and state budgets right so they want that enemy it's the same thing with terrorism right they want terrorism they fund terrorism right the united states is funding terrorist groups all over the world right the idea that they want to stamp that out when they're f literally funding it is, is ridiculous yeah well said ryan i was going to say that as well that everything you said is right and it links in with terrorism but what, the same way that they want crime, they want, I talked about it with um, Zanzi on, on the stream as well, that they want people being scared of the local scallies, they want people being scared of the lumpen. It's terror, they rule by terror. They want you to be afraid when you leave your house. So they might not be fucking ISIS nearby, but there's definitely poor scallies, chavs, neds, whatever you're going to call them, you know what I'm saying? The, the, you know, all these poor motherfuckers who do commit crimes to survive. They want you to be absolutely terrified of them because if the people ever fucking unite in, into working class and these lumping class that are so fucking terrifying, then, you, you know, again, we, we might all come together and start building a fucking revolutionary movement. And then before you know it, we're going to have these amazing gulags. <laughs> so uh, did you know that about the gulags, Ryan? What, what did you think? of what it said about him, um, the conditions of a gulag. Well, this, what he's talking about here is a theoretical gulag, which he would set up, would, you know, should the American Soviet government exist. But what I was talking about before, when I was talking about the sort of traditional gulags, is that the, even those were nowhere near as bad as people suggested, right? And um, people were paid and those kind of things, right? So people always like to think of them as like, oh no, they were concentration camps, but ultimately they were just prisons that even that, that paid people as well so they were absolutely nowhere near as bad as anyone suggests and that's what reminded me of them when he said here you know they're taught useful trades and paid full union wages for their work that reminded me of the og gulags right because they did that and they certainly weren't the sort of you know concentration camps that the, the cia wants you to believe they were so what comrade William Foster has done for us is rather than talk about you know and give analysis of the time she's literally <laughs> set up a plan on how to cure crime and to talk about the crime and the criminals in which a society under socialism and socialist America is supposed to cure. He really done what he said on the tin really with curing crime and criminals. It's just a shame that other people in the United States weren't as brilliant as him, I guess I could say. 
But if you live in the United States and you haven't read this text, definitely read this text. It's about the United States with a Soviet Union of states. It's a good idea, don't you think, Ryan? Would you like a Soviet Union in, of, of United States? I mean, yeah, sure. But that comes with all sorts of like, there's all sorts of like nuances and things that have to go into that, right? Like, first of all, it's decolonization. You're going to have to do that, um, which means you'd probably have to start with like the destruction of the um, constitution. So, you know, from the get go, things have to be pretty different such that I don't really see most people being on board with it, right? Because like sanctity to the constitution in the United States is put on par with like a religious document. So they're pretty much never going to let you touch it. Yeah, decolonization in the USA, I'm, I've, I'm not even going to comment because I just have not got any developed thoughts on it whatsoever. I've only heard other people's opinion of it and haven't got one myself. Like, and it's a very, very dis- difficult question. For sure. Okay, so I think that we've covered that, Ryan. Is there anything yes. you, you want to add on? No, no, I don't believe so. So... That's been Revolutionary Lump of Radio, Cure and Crime and Criminals by Comrade William Foster. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on whatever podcast player you're listening to. Follow us on Patreon, patreon.com slash lumpenpodcast. Give us any financial support if you can, and you also get some bonus content. You get your episodes early, and we'll also literally be your best mates. It's an easy way to get retweets as well on Twitter. So... All of that. Follow Ryan on the Zen Marxist on YouTube. You just mentioned philosophy. There's some philosophy on there as well, as well as political theory and, and overall analysis. Great videos, great content, great combat. We love you all. Peace, love, solidarity forever. Workers and lumping of the world, unite. Mr. Dracula. Seventy-five. There was this chick named Janet, a pregnant heroin addict who said she didn't plan it, so never thought to stop or ever kick the habit. Cause Kirby let her do it, and she knew he always had it. Down in this cellar with Trevor, another addict who was at it like an asthmatic, trapped in an attic, sucking on an asthma pump. Though you never know by looking at him, that's the cunt who by 1983 was in the National Front. Yeah, he had a shaved head, but still got mashed on drugs. So Kirby didn't mind him hanging around that much, especially any time Janet came round to fuck, get a fix while a kid Chris waited around. A nine-year-old boy who was healthy and loud Considering when she was pregnant she was smoking a brand And she was lucky that he wasn't born to save it somehow Still when you're too loud you get a clap round your head Kirby and his dad but he does what he says Stays downstairs in the cellar with Trev While Kirby's upstairs giving Janet a meds At least that's what they told Chris Still he ain't that dumb He knows Kirby's upstairs banging his mum While he's left in the basement with some racist cunt Who's been waiting round forever for this motherfucking day to come Mr. Jack, Mila, 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 Mila. What an environment to raise a kid Ran crack dealers' houses and racist pricks Trevor looted the place as well as Mame and Chris Left a permanent scar on his face the same as his With a razor blade, yeah, it takes the piss Whether you prejudice or not, man, it's just a kid But that's what Trevor done, no one ever saw him after that Six years passed, now Kirby's cooking up the crack It's the new drug, everybody's going crazy for 1989, the year Chris started selling draw Picking up from Kirby, scar there beneath his eye Think after everything that's happened, he would treat him right Not par him off with just another ounce of weed Cause a quarter of the bag is a bunch of fuck Seeds, hundreds of them and twigs the size of fucking trees But if he ever moan he get a slap across his cheek 1990 is the year that really took his toll Cause that's the year his mother Janet took an overdose of heroin and died God rest the tortured soul Now he's left to fend for himself Mr. or by his own it's 1995, now that he's older Stress weighs on his shoulders, heavy as boulders But he hides it from his olders He's been living on the far side since he was a youth But the way he lives now is a far cry From the way he did in the past Cause he's made his way up from selling out Just to bars of weed out in the streets But people do their nasty deeds He sees them making money so he wants a larger piece He's a man now, 21 years of age It's been a couple years since Kirby's palms were raised Lost in anger, ended up across his face Cause he's a man now and Kirby knows he's past the stage of getting beat so that don't change the way he treats Chris when he comes round to his to get his weed Kirby don't like his attitude, he's cocky now I believe So again he pass him off with more tweets and fucking seeds But Chris ain't having none of it, he ain't no little kid now He squares up to Kirby, you really don't look that big now I'm really can't do shit now, but pay Chris what he owes And we but also pride, cause that's what Chris takes when he goes Kirby knows he's getting old, and that's what really
really hurts He ain't cut for this work the way he was once upon a time But he don't know no other way to make a living on the grind Selling drugs to his been his only way of getting by Then the cops come round Undercover fed cops shot him down Lock him down Fifteen years away from now The youth will grow And big and strong and take control Yeah, well, it's my mum's. It's feel bad, innit? It's cool, man. I told you I'll pay back later. Safe, man. So what do you want? I want some weed. Weed? Does it look like man's blotting over here? Come on, man. Why are you always stalking me for? All right, you want some weed, yeah? Yeah. You want weed? Yeah. See, your guy. <laughs> your guy with a beat-up astro <laughs> Go over there and smash him in, and I'll give you a weed.